Grace to you and peace from God our Father, through Christ Jesus, his Son, our Lord, who is the only resurrection and life. Amen. Amen. Yeah, the uh, reading there that we had, especially for the Gospel, a different one there, because I think that's the next week. So I will have to go through and make some arrangements here. Because I've always loved that Doubting Thomas one, because, you know, it's, it's like if Jesus were here today, it was more like instead of, put your finger here, he was like, pull my finger. And you know what happens when a guy says, pull, you, pull my finger, right? You, you don't know that one? You know that one. Yeah. Because Jesus was just one of those guys, you know. But in the old liturgy, as I mentioned to the little kids, but the Latin name is quasi-motogenity. Sounds bad. But it has nothing to do with bell towers, Notre Dame, or having a really bad back. Quasi-motogenity means like newborn babies. You can construct all sorts of nice words by running parts together in Latin, sort of like in German. It's been the name of this Sunday, ever since the fourth century, when all the various churches throughout all the lands tried to come, come together and come up with a common liturgy. They tried, you know, this was the churches in the, in the Near East, the Middle East, and North Africa, and all the parts of Europe. And they were settling together to make one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Catholic in the sense of universal. But we sense that since then we've seen splits and splits and splits and splits and splits. And now people have seen, some churches have no idea what even what the word liturgy means. But to have a common liturgy throughout the churches was important because this way, no matter where you went and you went to a church, you would know exactly what was going on. And you knew that even when the sermon stank to you know where and back. You still got the gospel because the liturgy was taken directly from the Bible. All the little passages we sing are from the Psalms or from parts of the letters of St. Paul or even from the Gospel readings. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That's a big one. Let us lift up our hearts unto the Lord and give him thanks. That's another big one. All these things, important parts. And anyway, Easter, if you noticed during Lent, we have Wednesdays which are of Lent, but the Sundays are in Lent. Because every Sunday in this period was supposed to be considered a small Easter. Every Sunday is supposed to be a mini Easter. A celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and what that means for us and what it does for us. Because of Jesus, because of his rise from the dead, we have been made new creations, reborn in the image of God. And as such, we've been given a chance to start over. Every day we have a chance to start over, but especially after celebrating the resurrection of the Lord, this is something we can remember, that we can start fresh, like that new sprig that pops up in the springtime, or that first flower that blooms. And sooner or later, hopefully this rain will go away and we'll have that April rain brings May flowers, but so far I haven't seen any of that. But we are able to turn our faces upward to the Lord without shame. Because there's something that was there that was not there before. The veil has been taken away and we can see God face to face and we can approach him as part of his royal priesthood. Now in these United States, when people make a resolution, they usually try to do it sometime around the New Year, right? And it usually lasts to about maybe the third week of January. How many people actually maintain it? I am going to give up all high cholesterol foods. And then the day comes, I want short ribs. And there's nothing that's going to stop you from getting it. 
one of those things. There's nothing special about the beginning of New Year, is it? Because especially since our calendar does has no correspondence to anything that it's either a celestial action or even a biblical activity. Jesus was born in early April. And he was crucified in mid-April. He just celebrated his 33rd birthday. All these things happened at a time when, well, the church changed the calendar because all the pagan holidays from both the Romans and the Germans were still going on. And this was their way of putting Christian holidays right on top of those things. Like the, they put Christmas on the Yule Fest, where people would burn logs and put up trees to Odin. So this way they couldn't do both. You could either be a Christian or you could be a pagan. Because there were already too many people trying to cover both bases by being both. See that in the world today, don't we? Well, some days we, you know, when we're when we feeling really churchy, we go to the Lutheran church. But most of the time we go to one of these evangelical churches where we can raise our hands and and have, you know, all, you know they, they pick and choose. We celebrate the new year at a time when we will be should be celebrating our resolutions right after Easter, when we have been made new. Easter is a spiritual beginning of a new year. It's a time of starting fresh within our hearts. And choosing to start fresh means we have to unload the baggage. We've got to get rid of things in the past that are holding us back. Before too long, you'll start seeing people putting up yard sales. Yeah? Or I don't know, if you're in Berwyn, or you have amnesty days where people can put just about anything out in the curb and people drive around and pick up other people's junk. No, they, they got that in some suburbs. Like, uh, oh, your suburb doesn't it? Uh, yeah. A lot of them have those. And what happens with these is, you know, people stop at these and they find something that they think is a treasure and they'll buy it and they'll never use it. It'll go into their basement and sooner or later it'll end up in one of their yard sales or they'll be just be disposed of or taken over to Goodwill because some guy's wife told him to get rid of all of his treasures that she considers to be junk. She sets an ultimatum. Get rid of that stuff, or you're sleeping on the sofa. In a similar vein, though, we need to get rid of the baggage in our lives, from our hearts, the baggage from the attics, the basements, and the dark places within our souls, so that we might travel lightly through this world, and when the Lord calls us, we have as few regrets as possible. We don't want to have any anchors that make, it, make us hesitate from going out into the world, out from this world, and into the world to come. And the junk with which we accumulate our lives, whether it's material or spiritual junk, holds us down. It also fills our hearts in a way so that it makes it difficult for, him, for us to receive God's daily blessings. If we think that we have everything under our control, then how can we let the Lord let us know that He's the one who's in control? If we think that we should hold on to everything just in case, just in case we might need it. Well, you've seen the television program Hoarders, right? Isn't it? Those are people who decided to keep everything just in case. I might need that newspaper from 1984. Don't you dare throw it away. Yeah. Of course, some newspapers are actually valuable. Okay. I, want, I know one young, one, an elderly lady, didn't even know she had it. It was a uh, Look magazine. I don't know if you, any of you know about Look magazine. It goes way, way back. This one was from 1963. And the cover was... JFK assassinated. She had no idea she had this magazine and it was almost in fine condition. That was probably worth a small fortune. But when she passed away, her, her kids probably just threw them all away. They didn't know that she had this. They didn't sort through it because she just had so much. It was amazing. 
Nevertheless, in the end, it's still just junk, isn't it? Paper? Anything there you can take with you in the world to come? Nothing at all. So what you need to find out is what is the burden in your heart? What is it that you're unable to let go? You need to find that spot and start working on it. In many people, in many places, many cases, it's people who are unwilling to think, okay, circumstances have changed. The world is not what it used to be. And they regret that because so many things have changed, they've become fearful. I once received an email, it's about 15 years ago, but from a woman who was talking about how the world has changed. And the email went like this. I, I keep certain things because they're just useful. One evening, a young boy was talking with his grandfather about current events. The grandson asked his grandfather what he thought about all the shootings in the schools and computer age and just about everything in general. And grandpa replied, well, let's see. I was born before there was television, penicillin, polio shots, frozen foods, copy machines, contact lenses, certainly home computers, frisbees, and most certainly cell phones. There was no radar, there was no credit cards, you paid cash on the barrel or you put it on layaway. There were no ballpoint pens. No one yet had invented nylon pantyhose. They were silk or nothing else. No one had air conditioners, except in the theaters. Dishwashers, hose dryers, and no one had yet walked on the moon, obviously. So our lives were governed by the Ten Commandments and good judgment and good common sense. We were taught to know the difference between right and wrong and to stand up and take responsibility for our actions. I don't think people have thought that anymore. Serving your country was a privilege and living in this country was a greater privilege. We thought fast food was what you ate during Lent. We never heard of FM radios, tape decks, CDs, or electric typewriters. We listened to the big bands like Jack Dorsey, Jack Benny, all of those. And the president's speeches were on the radio and everybody turned in to listen to them. McDonald's and pizza delivery and instant coffee were just not around. We had five and 10 cents stores where you could actually go and buy something for five and 10 cents. Ice cream cones, phone calls, rides on a streetcar, and a bottle of Pepsi all cost a nickel. And if you didn't want to splurge, you could spend your nickel on enough postage stamps to mail one letter and two postcards. You could buy a new Chevy Coupe for $600, but who had that much money? To get, because in those days, gasoline was 11 cents a gallon. That was nice. How old was this, Grandpa? At the time this was written, he was 57. Now he would be 77. Not that far long ago, was born in 1945. Not to mention, of course, email wasn't around at all, or I wouldn't have received this from this little lady. There are all these newfangled things that scare us because there were so many changes so quickly. In one lifetime, people saw what? People driving around with these great big, you know, huge eight-cylinder eight, eight inline engines, you know, the, the long box that got like four miles to a gallon, but nobody cared. And that stank to, to high heaven because it burned so much oil. You had to put in a quart every time you filled up the gas tank. Nobody cared. And they loved it. And there was always room enough that if you had to fix it, the compartment was big enough that you could crawl inside, inside under the hood with the engine to actually get to it. I open up the hood to my car now and it's like, oh, I can get a finger in here, but that's about it. Everything has to be done from the underside. 
even thing because it's an overhead cam, the spark plugs are where? Underneath. Can't do anything about that. Things have changed. But do you wonder why sometimes older people get afraid of the future because so much has already happened? And just think of what could happen in the lifetime of the youngsters here. Well, when I was a kid, you know, the best you could do was pretend you were flying a shuttle, but now we're going to the moon on a weekly basis. Could happen. Don't know. All these newfangled things just create more and more baggage in our minds and in our hearts because we cling to them. And it can make the world feel like it's a hostile place because the unknown is often fearful. And few new things fit into the categories that we expect. The only safe place in every generation has always been the church. Because the management never changes. Jesus was and is and ever shall be the head of his holy church. And if you're not hearing the words from the pulpit that your grandfather would have heard from the pulpit, then you need to do something about stoning your pastor for being a false prophet. Of course, your grandfather's pastor would never say, pull my finger, you know, just one of those things. It wouldn't happen. Nevertheless, would he have told you that you gotta get rid of your baggage from your hearts? Yeah, because why? We gotta be ready to go when Jesus says it's time to go. And we have to realize that we are helpless apart from the Lord. We are very much like newborn babies. If the Lord did not want us to be clothed, we would not be clothed. If he did not want us to eat, then we would not be fed. If the Lord did not want us to breathe, well, that's it for us. Everything is in the hands of the Lord. And he is the giver of all good gifts. And sometimes he is also the giver of those gifts that we don't appreciate so much. Because why? We need it in order to grow up. In order to mature. In order to be better than we used to be. And so to be like a baby is to have faith and have dependence. Because we look at the world with bright eyes. The most interesting thing and the most marvelous thing that I've always enjoyed was watching little children, two, three, four-year-olds, explore the world because for them everything is new and exciting and wonderful. You ever have a two-year-old who suddenly found the pots and pans under the sink in the kitchen and discovered that they were making a great musical instrument, <clears throat> at least to the child? And then what do you do? You got to let them play, right? Without exploring the world, they don't learn. Especially, they don't learn how irritating it is to mom. But that first thing that happens is, what's the most marvelous thing a child, when they open their eyes for the first time, what's the most marvelous, most beautiful thing that they see? Mom's face. Dad's face. Family. And automatically, because they have no choice, they put their trust in them, to feed them, to care for them, to love them, to keep them warm and safe. And we are to have that attitude with our Lord, knowing that apart from Him, we are indeed helpless. And so we trust Him to keep us clothed, keep us fed, keep us warm, and keep us safe in this world until it's time for us to go. And when we go, we go with a glad heart. Because where do we know that we are going? As the children of God, where is our home? Heaven is our home. We are the children of the Heavenly Father, and we are going home. This is just a time of journey and of growing and of maturing. And so finding out for the first time something new in your life. No matter how old you may get, you think, I've seen it all. 
No, you haven't. There's always something new. When was the last time you caught a firefly and just watched it glow in your hands and let go? Done that since you're a kid? Beautiful, isn't it? Those little bugs? Don't squash them. It's stinky. And they don't like it either. They die. But just catch one and just play with it a little while and blow it off. Don't do that with mosquitoes. It's a bad idea. Fireflies, great. Dragonflies, great if you can get, if you can get them to slow down fast enough. And it's like that. Enjoy what God sends us in our lives day by day. Because he's sending each of us something new to rejoice and to be glad and to know that he is the Lord over all. That he has caused the winds to blow and he caused the rains to fall and he caused the oceans to say you may go this far and no further. And he has given us the dry land and for us to tend. And in the big picture, knowing that the Lord is in control of all these things, even the greatest surprise of all, absolutely the most greatest surprise, is that he loves us so much that he sent his only begotten, his spiritual son, from all eternity to come down and to be one of us so that we, as rotten and stinky little babies as we are, in need of a change, he still loves us and always has. And can't we rejoice in that? And may the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding fill our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.